Welcome back again, everyone. So happy you made time for me. Laszlo Montgomery here with part three of this little CHP overview of the Warlord era in China, 1916 to 1928. Thanks, everyone, who have signed up and contributed to my Patreon page. That's at patreon.com slash China History Podcast. You, too, can join this growing and elite group of CHP listeners who get all the inside poop on everything that's coming up on the CHP horizon, plus a regular supply of juicy and revealing stories that I dish up from my past. Shilling for Chinese manufacturers. Patreon.com slash China History Podcast. We left off last episode in the year 1916, with the death of Yuan Shi Kai. At such a time as this in China, couldn't have come at a more inopportune time. World War I was still raging in Europe, The foreign powers, Great Britain, France, Germany, and the United States, were all tied up dealing with this, up till that time, most terrible of all wars. Although Japan wasn't exactly given a free hand in China, they sure were starting to act like they had one. At this critical juncture in history, when China could have gotten things together and used the events of World War I to their advantage, things just went from bad to worse. And for the next 12 years, a lot of suffering is going to be felt in China's cities, towns, and villages. Let's look at what happened in China immediately following the death of Yuan Shi Kai. The men who first tried to step into Yuan's large size shoes were Duan Qi Rui and Feng Guozhang. I thought we could hold these two up to the light and use Duan and Feng as prisms to recount the events that unfolded in the summer of 1916 and into 1917. Over on the European continent, as Yuan Shi Kai was laid to rest, the Battle of Verdun was happening in northeast France. About 300,000 troops died in that battle. These new weapons and armaments that had emerged at the dawn of the 20th century were proving to be frightfully devastating. There will be Quite a demand in China for a lot of these weapons of war after the Treaty of Versailles. Duan Qi Rei was born and raised in the capital of Anhui province, Hefei. He remained associated with this province throughout his life and career. He had a halfway decent pedigree, having a grandfather who fought with Li Hongzhang and his Huai army. Li Hongzhang, by the way, also born and raised in Hefei. Anhui province was always the central power base of Duan Qi Rei, but as we'll see, he also served in a number of positions in the Republic of China government. Almost every northern warlord I'm going to mention from here on out got their start in some shape or form due to their relationship with Yuan Shi Kai. Duan Qi Rei and Feng Guozhang were no exception. They were both direct beneficiaries of Yuan's rise to the top of the political and military food chains in China. Like I said, Duan came from this military family, and he went straight into a military career by way of the Tianjin Military Academy, one of the many of such kinds of institutions put in place by Li Hongzhang, this one in 1885, in his efforts to modernize and organize China's military. In the course of the early part of Duan Qi Rei's career in Shandong, he got himself noticed by Li Hongzhang. Li sent Duan to Germany for two years to go learn from the best. For military science, Germany and Japan were the two top places at the end of the 19th century for an aspiring Chinese militarist to learn a thing or two. Duan came back to China and went straight into the Beiyang military organization and made his way up to the rank of military commander in Yuan Shi Kai's personal pet project, the New Army. You recall the New Army from Part 1, after China's disastrous showing in the Sino-Japanese War, the building of this Xinjun New Army was among the top priority military reform efforts of the Qing dynasty. Duan stood right by Yuan Shi Kai's side in Shandong province during the Boxer Rebellion. Yuan was serving there as provincial governor. Duan Qi Rei saw action during this uprising that would later 
prove so devastatingly costly to China. Duan Qi Rei was then able to parlay this feather in his cap into a command of his own division in the Beiyang Army. Then in 1906, things really began to gel for Duan Qi Rei. In these dying days of the Qing, the Qing Chao Mornian, the Mornian, if you will, Duan was given a plum posting at the Baoding Military Academy. In its day, this was the West Point of China, the top military training center, founded by none other than Yuan Shikai. This Baoding Military Academy served as the model for the later Wampoa Military Academy down in Guangzhou. Jiang Kai-shek's later rise to the top of the ROC government is said to have started as the head guy at Wampoa. And Jiang took a page out of Duan Qi Rei's playbook later on when, by using his position as commandant at the Wampoa Military Academy, to incubate a sizable coterie of followers who would all play central roles in the warlord years. Duan did the same thing while heading the Baoding Military Academy. The Anhui clique, as it came to be known, really started to take shape right around here. Duan used his positions to assemble quite an impressive number of officers and loyal supporters. And Yuan Shikai had fortified his relationship with Duan Qi Rei by arranging a marriage between Duan and his niece. So you can see why Duan Qi Rei, as soon as Yuan dies, is the natural choice for capo de capo of the Beiyang military organization. Duan continued to benefit from Yuan Shikai's rise. He was appointed the military governor of Hubei province. And then came the Wuchang Uprising and the Xinhai Revolution, 1911, all discussed briefly last episode in part two. It wasn't all roses between Yuan and Duan. After the revolution and after the trauma of agreeing on the first provisional government for the ROC in 1912, Duan was made minister of war in Yuan Shikai's cabinet. He still ran Hubei. And then starting from about here... Yuan and Duan started to disagree on a number of things. And Duan Qi Rei, I guess you could say right about now, using his powerful cabinet position, a minister of war, sort of tries to become his own man and come out from behind Yuan Shikai's shadow. During Yuan's ill-fated run for the emperorship, he had sacked Duan Qi Rei as military governor down at Hubei, as well as from his position as minister of war. Yuan also went to the trouble to clean house in the Beiyang upper echelons of any Duan Qi Rei allies that Duan had put in place. But in the end, after his bid to make himself emperor fizzled, Yuan Shikai had to swallow his pride and rely on Duan Qi Rei to act as the mediator between himself and the rest of the country, who had all lined up against him on this ill-conceived idea. Then with Yuan's passing, his vice president, Li Yuan Hong, took over as president, and Duan Qi Rei, according to the terms of Yuan Shikai's will, took over as premier. The parliament that Yuan Shikai had dissolved in 1914 was put back together by August 1916. Duan could hardly mask his disappointment at Li Yuanhong, who in his role as president was trying to govern rather than act as Duan Qi Rei's stooge. So Duan Qi Rei had basically the same mindset as his one-time mentor, Yuan Shikai, as most world leaders will generally concur. It's a lot easier to do your job in the capacity of a dictator rather than within the limitations of a democracy. And that's how Duan liked to run things, from the top down. And this included the signing of the so-called Nishihara loans with Japan that came to haunt China at the Treaty of Versailles. About $90 million in loans, mostly to be utilized by Duan's Anhui clique, in exchange for a rather free hand in railroad construction and management in Shandong, Manchuria, and Mongolia. The hope was that the North and South could reconcile and pick up where they left off before Yuan Shikai started becoming so autocratic. But this wasn't meant to be, and squabbles remained about, what else? Sharing of political power. 
It was as serious back then as it is today. And China in the post Yuan Shikai period had one power base in the north, led by this Beiyang clique, and in the south, led by the KMT, the Guomindang. The west of China, I won't get into that right now. And not only were the Beiyang clique leaders, starting with Duan Rei, at loggerheads with the KMT, even within the Beiyang government itself, things were not terribly collegial. Before we discuss the Anhui Zhili rivalry, let me introduce Feng Guozhang. As I said, Feng Guozhang was another Yuan Shikai man who rose up the ranks and, like Duan Qi Rei, got to use the Baoding Military Academy as a breeding ground to groom his own followers. Unlike Duan Qi Rei, who came from a military family, the army was not Feng Guozhang's first choice for a career. He was a failed scholar who had taken the path of the civil bureaucracy, but he was never able to pass the exam that might have opened the door to that life for him. Instead, he turned to the military and never looked back. Feng Guozhang was born and raised in Hebei province, which back then was known as Zhili. You remember Zhili from part one. He was also very close to Yuan Shikai and had been part of that gang that forced the Qing Emperor Puyi to abdicate. He had remained very loyal to Yuan Shikai and played key roles during the aftermath of the Wuchang uprising. Like Duan Qi Rei and everyone else in China, Feng lined up against Yuan Shikai when he tried to make himself emperor. Even his best friends and closest allies would support him. To show he meant business, Feng Guozhang had left the north and headed to the KMT stronghold of Nanjing to fight in the anti-Yuan National Protection War that I mentioned last episode. And now, in 1917, Feng Guozhang found himself serving as vice president of the Republic of China, second in command of the president, Li Yuanhong, Feng and Duan used their positions of political and military power and authority to stuff their offices with loyal followers. Feng, coming from Zhili and all, hand-selected officers and staff who all came from that province. And Duan Qi Rei, an Anhui man, put together an organization that mostly came from Anhui. So you can probably guess which one headed the Zhili clique and which one the Anhui clique. You had the umbrella Beiyang clique organization, formerly headed by Yuan Shikai, and then after he's gone, Feng and Duan split into two separate cliques with two separate armies. Let me just mention one more warlord from this period. I mentioned him last time in part two. This was Zhang Xun, and 1917 was a Big year for this man, known as both the Mafu warlord and the pigtail general, among other epithets. Chang Xun was actually a few years older than Yuan Shikai and had fought the Sino-French War, 1884-85. He had come from nothing, from a town just west of Nanchang in Jiangxi province. He was called the Mafu general because he had once worked as a Mafu a kind of horse groom. Very humble beginnings. And as far as his being called the pigtail general, well, that was the main thing about Zhang Xun. He was extremely loyal to the Qing dynasty. Very ultra-conservative, traditionalist, through and through. In fact, one of his early claims to fame had been that he was the one who escorted the Empress Dowager Cixi and her entourage to safety when they had to flee the Forbidden City at the end of the Boxer Rebellion. So he was loyal to the Qing, and even after the revolution in 1911, refused to cut off his queue. And soldiers that were under his command, well, he forbade them to cut off their queues as well. So despite the Republican times they lived in, Zhang Xun, this reactionary and dyed-in-the-wool royalist, he flew the flag in China as chief defender of pre-revolutionary values and institutions. Despite all this, he remained a staunch and reliable ally of Yuan Shikai and had served him well at a few key moments, particularly, as I said, in crushing the 
KMT forces who fought back during the Second Revolution, June to November 1913. I mentioned last episode, you may recall, another one of the Mafu warlords claims to fame. After Nanjing was taken, Zhang Xun sat back and allowed his troops to have three days of looting and a whole lot more throughout the city. He didn't line up with Yuan Shikai when he did the whole emperor thing, but he remained neutral while everyone else in the north and south had their knives out. You'd think he would have backed Yuan, but... Zhang Xun's loyalty was to the Qing dynasty, so he couldn't support Yuan's bid for the emperorship. He was a powerful military man and had a lot of fighting power. So with Yuan out of the way, starting in 1916, Zhang Xun had his own ideas about what was best for China. Fellow militarists of like mind formed an association of provincial military governors. This became the main voice of the warlords. Zhang Xun took the lead in calling for the first of three conferences to be held, comprised of all these generals and future warlords. All of these conferences were held in the historic city of Xuzhou in northern Jiangsu, right where it meets the borders of Anhui and Shandong. The first meeting was held on June 9th, 1916, a few days after Yuan Shikai died. There were representatives from seven of the northern provinces. How to handle the post-Yuan era was a topic of high priority. The second conference was held on September 20th, a few months later. This one was attended by representatives from 12 provinces, all the military top brass. In a moment of solidarity, they all agreed to form a grand alliance amongst themselves and made Zhang Xun the great leader of the alliance. The group was comprised of all the deciders for any key decision that required central government approval. These militarists, though it wasn't their place, began to speak out about which political leaders selected to serve in the government were suitable or not. Then in January 1917, there was a third Shuzhou conference held. By the time of this conference, everyone was jumping into the political arena. The rift that existed between Duan Qi Rei, representing the militarists, and Li Yuan Hong, representing the central government, started to grow. The biggest bone of contention at this post Yuan Shikai moment concerned China's position on declaring war on Germany and joining the Allies or remaining neutral. Li Yuan Hong wanted to stay out of the conflict. Duan Qi Rei, with Japan lobbying him like crazy, was all for declaring war on Germany. This was the most immediate cause for the current political crisis in Republican China. The Beiyang leaders, led by Duan Qi Rei, after dissolving parliament on June 12, 1917, were all huddled together in Tianjin in June, leaving Li Yuanhong with a feeling of uncertainty, I guess you could say. Once Li Yuanhong had gotten wind of Duan Qi Rei's perfidy in signing the Nishihara loans and opening up China's front door and letting Japan inside, so to speak, he canned Duan as premier. So that's why Duan was now hunkering down in Tianjin with all his military allies planning his response. He was putting Li Yuanhong's feet to the fire, forcing him to see the light. So with all these army generals and commanders not too far away from the capital, rattling their sabers, Li Yuanhong, recognizing that might makes right, invited Jiang Xun to come to Beijing to broker a solution between his government and the military leaders lining up against him. So I've told you a few of the historic moments in Jiang Xun's life, but this one really takes the cake along with that whole business of keeping his hair Manchu-style, complete with Q, and and being a rather colorful character, when he got to Beijing with his troops, rather than do what Li Yuanhong asked him to do, broker a solution to the political impasse, he tried to restore the Qing dynasty instead. Zhang Xun had not only declared the restoration of the Qing, as part of the deal, he called for the return of all Qing imperial institutions. He thought, or was led to believe, his fellow Beiyang military generals were okay with this whole Qing restoration thing. 
But just like with Yuan Shikai and his monarchical dreams, the support the Ma Fu general was counting on from his fellow warlords wasn't there. And this Manchu Restoration of 1917 lasted July 1st to July 12th. Pu Yi got to be the last emperor not once, but twice. But then right after Zhang Xun pulled the trigger on this restoration, Duan Qi Rei and his other Beiyang allies started making deals with Li Yuan Hong, obviously under great duress. And before you knew it, Duan Qi Rei was returned to the government as premier, and fellow Beiyang stalwart Feng Guazhang was installed as acting president. Li Yuan Hong was out. Once everyone shook hands on this new arrangement, Duan, on behalf of all his military allies, ordered troops to head in the direction of Beijing. Mere moments before, Duan and Li Yuan Hong were at each other's throats. Now, Duan and his allies were on the side of the Republic, and they proceeded to quickly quash this whole bad idea of a Qing restoration before it could ever catch fire. Zhang Xun ended up fleeing with his troops and had to lay low for the rest of his life. He was pardoned in 1918, but you don't hear much of him after that. He died on 9-11, 1923. So he was marginalized early on in the warlord era, but sure left his mark in early ROC history. Here is where things start to get real complicated, if they weren't complicated enough already. Things really start to break down from this point forward. The central government of the Republic of China was... No, it was nothing more than the government of whichever warlord seized and occupied Beijing. Whatever government officials and politicians serving in Beijing, they remained puppets of the warlord du jour. You'll see between now and the final buzzer, Beijing is going to change hands as warlords contend for this most important of cities. And pretty much after Zhang Xun's big moment, attempting to restore the Qing dynasty, everyone who hadn't taken a side yet started taking sides. And any warlords and military governors in other parts of China, they didn't want to be part of these Beiyang generals and their puppet state. They just declared their province independent. And if the North wanted to force them into unifying with their government, well, they could come on down and try and make them. So this whole Zhang Xun, Manchu, Qing restoration move really kicked the hornet's nest, so to speak. The way everything ended up and the immediate fallout, it was sort of a coup d'etat with the Jirli and Anhui cliques in control of things. In the north, anyway. I haven't even gotten started on what was happening south of the Yangtze. They had plenty of warlords, too. Then, on August 14, 1917, with Li Yuanhong, his primary opposition out of the way, Duan Qi Rei declared war on Germany and Austria. The Chinese Labor Corps, who we looked at in episode CHP 207, had already been serving in Europe for a year. And a month later, after Duan's declaration of war down in Guangzhou, Sun Yat-sen, remember him, he set up a rival Chinese government. It didn't get much recognition, but he continued to keep that KMT flame alive down in the south. Feng Guozhang made a sincere effort to become a peacemaker between the northern and southern governments. Unfortunately, he wasn't fated to live long and died in Beijing in December 1919. This is going to shake things up in the Zhirli clique that he led. Two warlords will emerge to take over from Feng Guozhang. So you can see how this warlord problem keeps dividing and growing. From Yuan came Duan and Feng. From Feng came two more warlords who we'll look at next episode. Yuan Shikai, Duan Qi Rei, Feng Guozhang, Zhang Xun. These were all the first generation warlords, the ones who occupied the stage during that critical juncture in Chinese history when the revolution was launched and the Qing dynasty fell. Their solution to the setting up of a new nation was always a military solution. And still, up to now, this whole Republic of China idea had been an abysmal failure. So you can see why. When Zhang Xun tried to restore the Qing, 
he actually had a lot of support from a wide segment of the population who had had enough with this failed experiment in democracy and constitutional government. Rather than introduce what happens next, why don't we just say class dismissed a little early today? Please refer to the terms that I painstakingly put together for you each episode. Go to the website at teacup.media and click on the Terms for this Episode tab. Every Chinese name mentioned in this episode will be listed in pinyin, characters, and English. All for your inconvenience. That should help you a little if you're drowning in all these Chinese names. Once more, with feeling, I hope you'll consider going to patreon.com and join other CHB stalwarts and admirers of this podcast show that goes all out for you to bring you the best in Chinese history. If you can't find patreon.com, go to my website at teacup.media and there's a link to the Patreon page right there. Okay, part four coming next time. Nothing's really getting messy. You won't want to miss it. This is Laszlo Montgomery coming to you from the Southland once again, Los Angeles, California, and the Golden State. Please join me next time, won't you, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.